Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me? I'm not sure if you can. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Krista, <laughs> Sherilyn, thank you. Okay, I just wanted to make sure you could hear me. I know sometimes computers. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and have our um, lesson today, our group meeting today. Um, I'm glad you, everyone can hear me. Yeah, perfect. Um, and I think the PowerPoint is showing, so I think we'll just go ahead and get started. Today we're going to be um, talking about something that's really important, and it's our sterile processing department. So this lesson is split up into um, two, two, um, two uh, well, like two sections, I guess. So we have the one this week, and then the one next week, um, and we need to go ahead and cover all of this. I do apologize. I know my energy might be a little bit off today. I'm going to try my best. Um, unfortunately, um, my uncle did pass away from COVID yesterday. And so uh, that's a pretty heavy loss that's weighing on all of us right now. But I know that, that the work that we do as infection preventionists and epidemiologists are so, so, so important. It's so important that we do this and it's so important that we take care of our patients. Um, and I really value our group and our group members. Um, and I, I know that learning this stuff is what keeps our patients, our family members and everyone that we love safe. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and go through some um, definitions. Now, I thought that this, I had this set up differently, but I did not double check. So these next couple of slides, we're going to go through some definitions that are extremely important for you to know and for you to do well in your exam. So oh, why does this keep being difficult? Why are you being like this? Okay. Okay. I think it's working now. Okay. So let's let's go ahead and go through these. Um, now I wish I had a way of covering this slide, this part here, but I can't. So the first one is going to be um, the destruction of pathogenic or disease-causing microorganisms, usually by physical or chemical means, and that's going to be our disinfection. Next, we have a device used to monitor the presence of one or more predefined process parameters required for a satisfactory sterilization process. And we have six classes of chemical indicators which are defined in the ANSI AMI ST79. Now, one of the key things that I want you to remember for this is going to be this word process parameters. When you're dealing with um, your chemical indicators and biological indicators, I often find that people get these very easily confused um, and they, they think, okay, this is a way that we're testing the sterilizer. And so they tend to um, get them mixed up or often combine them. So what I want you to think about with our chemical indicators is we are looking at predefined parameters. We're looking at temperature, humidity, like those are the kind of parameters that we're looking at for chemical indicators. Um, so please remember that so that you're not confusing a chemical indicator with a biological indicator, which is a bit further down. Um, aeration, so this is a process step using warm circulating air to enhance the removal of a chemical sterilization agent residue from processed items and wrapping material. Next is decontamination. This is one that we've covered multiple times, but it's extremely important that you always, always remember that the APIC definition, which is what you're going to see on your CIC examination, is they're going to have the wording, the following wording, rendering the item safe for handling. Okay, so for decontamination, it's the use of physical or chemical methods to remove inactivate or destroy bloodborne pathogens, rendering them no longer able to transmit infectious particles and rendering the item safe for handling. So please um, remember rendering the item safe for handling is linking back to your decontamination process. Next will be ethylene oxide. This is a chemical gas that is used to sterilize heat 
or moisture sensitive items also used as a fumigant. So our ethylene oxide um, is one of those sterilizing agents that has very specific um, parameters and requirements, you know, from the type of room that you have it in um, to the type of monitoring that you have to do. Um, it's one of our more difficult <laughs> It's one of our more difficult um, agents that we use to sterilize. Um, and there are some facilities who use it. There's other facilities who don't. I know a lot of um, places are phasing this out. So, um, you know, do you currently have a ethylene oxide um, sterilizer at your facilities? Do you guys use ETO? Okay, some of you do, and then some of you are like, I'm not sure, I don't, you know, I don't believe so, yes, okay, okay. Stacy says, in Washington State, many counties do not allow its use. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit more of, a, it's a bit more toxic than other methods. Okay, next we're going to talk about our biological indicators. So remember, this is the one that you do not want to confuse with the chemical indicator. So biological indicator, this device contains a viable population of highly resistant bacterial spores that are resistant to the type or method of sterilization being monitored. So I, <laughs> the example I like to use when you're dealing with chemical indicators versus um, biological indicators is the word bio means, what does bio mean? Or what does it, you know, represent, stand for? Okay, very good. Yes, life, something that's living. Um, so you're using a form of a viable population of these bacterial spores um, that you're using for biological indicators. Now, um, try to remember that because you may be finding yourself, you know, getting confused, um, uh, you know, getting confused on, it, well, is it a chemical or is it a biological? So remember, parameters for your chemical, then you have your viable populations for um, for your biological indicators. What is the name of one of the most common um, bacteria that are used for these biological indicators? Some of you may know, some of you may, may not know. <laughs> Some <laughs> stereo something something. <laughs> oh, you guys are kind of putting it all together. Everybody's putting in little bits and pieces. Like somebody wrote stereo, another person wrote um, uh, thermo, another person. Okay, no, that's pretty good. Yeah, so geobacillus stearothermophilus maybe. Um, so yeah, it's it's. I remember when I was uh, studying for um, my CRCST certification. I had to keep putting it that one on the back of the index cars. You know, I had to be like, okay, yes, remember this one. This is, you know, this is one of the most common ones that, that we use. Remember the name, remember the name. So uh, definitely, definitely. Okay, let's go to the next one. Why is it not? Guys, I don't know what's going on today, but it's like, the slide doesn't want to advance. Next slide. Okay, okay. All right. So let's go ahead and do the first one. Declaration by a medical device manufacturer that a product is sterile on the basis of physical or chemical process data after validating the cycle using biological indicators. So declaration by the medical device manufacturer that a product is sterile on the basis of physical or chemical process data after validating the cycle use using the biological indicators. All right, parametric release. Very good. Very good for those of you who did that. Who got that one? Okay, 
Next, equipment that uses hot water for a definite period to destroy pathogenic bacteria often used for respiratory therapy and anesthesia equipment. So the hint here is respiratory therapy. You should immediately be thinking, okay, I know for respiratory therapy, this is one of the most common things that we can use. Now keep in mind, not every hospital has one. So some of you may not have this at your hospital. I do not have one at my hospital. It's not immediate use, steam sterilization. Okay. All right, it's a pasteurizer. It's a pasteurizer, yes. All right, next. Concept that items are considered sterile unless the integrity of the packaging is compromised. So being torn, soiled, wet, or showing any evidence of tampering, and the shelf life is indefinite. This is a pretty self-explanatory one. Okay, very good. Event-related sterility. Good job. Next, a popular low temperature sterilization method used to process heat or moisture sensitive items because of its short cycle and faster turnaround time, but with packaging and lumen limitations packaging and lumen limitations. So we should kind of be, you know, uh, narrowing it down. This is, it's a low temperature sterilization method, short cycle, so Immediate use steam sterilization. I, I This one keeps coming up. I want you to think, is steam sterilization a low temperature sterilization method? Right? Because that, these are the kind of, you know, one of the things I always tell people is when you get to a test, and you come across a question and you're a little bit you know hesitant you need to ask yourself you need to take a take a moment and ask yourself what do i know what do i know and just on your in your mind start listing some things that you know and that should you know that should help to guide you you know for steam we're going to be using higher temperatures than we would for other methods such as hydrogen peroxide all right so you have to talk yourself through this even though we're just going through um definitions right now it's going to be the same way on the test you need to learn these test taking strategies so that you're able to walk yourself to the right answer all right next is a process designed for cleaning steam sterilization and delivery of patient care items for immediate use all right yes immediate use steam sterilization they previously called it flash flash sterilization um, fast like the flash, you know, the guy that runs real fast. Um, yes, but IUSS is correct. All right, and then the last one is going to be our parasitic acid. So liquid oxidizing agent used in automated endoscope reprocessors and items processed with this agent need to be used immediately because they are wet and cannot be packaged and stored for later, used. later use. <laughs> All right, next. Okay, let's go through this one. Oh no, what did I do? I apologize. <laughs> okay, so yes, the state of being free from all living organisms is sterile. Now, another definition that you may be, uh, that they may bring up to you is, um, they can give you a numeric value. So 10 to the, would be considered sterile. 10 to the what? to the WEF power. Yes, six. Very good. Very good, Tanisia. Yep, 10 to the negative six. Good job. All right. Now, it may be on the test. It may not be on the test, but now you know. All right. Next is a visible monitor. So, time, temperature, and pressure recorders, digital printouts, and gauges that enables the operator to determine if sterilizing parameters were met. So what would this, what would these be called? 
It's not a process challenge device. This is a, a visible monitor and it's literally so so I think the 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 biggest clue for this one for me personally is this part right here that says digital printouts because I know that I'm already thinking of okay this is going to be a physical this is going to be a physical monitor when we have our digital printouts. So I can I'm getting a lot of different answers for these. So what it's letting me know is that we have a lot of concepts and ideas that are a little muddled. So we have to clear these out. We have to kind of tear these apart. The best way for you to get prepared for this section of your exam is if you have access to a serial processing department is to spend time with them. I want you to put it on your calendar, set aside two to three hours, you know, every week if you can, to go spend time in SPD, spend time in decontam, go to assembly, you can shadow, you can learn, they can teach you. That is gonna be the absolutely best way to prepare for this. Obviously reading is fantastic. When I took my test, I did not have access to a sterile processing department, but when I became an IP, you know, this past year, one of my big goals was getting my CRCST and I was able to do that. Um, and I can't even tell you how important that was. You'd learn so much. Okay, part of the chemical indicator labeling that provides a value or values of critical variables, of, of a critical variable at which the indicator is designed to reach its endpoint as defined by the manufacturer. Part of the chemical indicator labeling that provides a value or values of a critical variable at which the indicator is designed to reach its endpoint as defined by the manufacturer. That's going to be our stated value. Next, class one chemical indicators to use as an external chemical indicator on the outside of packages or containers to demonstrate that the unit has been exposed to the sterilization, sterilization process and to distinguish between processed and unprocessed units. Good job, Michelle, Tunisia. Good job, Fran. Those are going to be our process indicators. Okay. I'm not having a lot of um, people answering these, so that's why I, I'm feeling like we have a lot of hesitancy. People aren't really sure what, what the answer could be. All right, item designed to create a challenge to the sterilization process and used for routine and qualification testing of sterilizers. And it was previously referred to as a test pack. Good job, Jessica. Good job, Felicia, Felicia, Krista, Michelle. Cindy, Charles, what's your answer? Item designed to create a challenge to the sterilization process and used for routine and qualification testing of sterilizers, previously referred to as a test pack. All right, process challenge device. Um, I know process challenge devices and biological indicators can often get confused. Um, well, let's not dive into that now. I don't want to confuse anybody, um, but yes, definitely need to needs to be discussed. All right, probability of a single single viable microorganism occurring on an item after sterilization normally expressed as 10 to the negative six, which means there is less than or equal to one chance in a million that a single viable organism um, is, pre is present on a sterilized item. And that's gonna be our sterility assurance level. Perfect. Okay, true or false, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, ethylene oxide sterilizers were developed to address the reprocessing of heat sensitive devices. True or false? Is ETO something that we use for heat sensitive devices? Yep. 
It is true. So one of the ways um, that I really appreciated um, the, that the Isham text broke down the the sterilization methods is you have you know a lot of your steam sterilization and then some of your low um, heat or low, lower temperature heat sensitive methods of sterilization for those types of you know um, instruments you know different types of things that that we may use in healthcare that require um, a low temperature method of sterilization and that's one way that you can kind of split it start to split things up in your brain okay steam I know I have certain you know certain temperatures, parameters that I'm going to be using for heat sensitive, your hydrogen peroxide, um, I'm going to be using different values, different numbers, times. So one of the best YouTube channels out there for you to get more familiar with this is this one. <laughs> I discovered this channel when I was trying to study for my CRCST because I have always told you guys I'm an auditory visual learner. I can hear things um, when I'm taking a test, like I can hear a voice, you know, almost in the back of my head. Like it's very easy for me to remember sounds um, and especially when I can see a visual to it. Some people don't work like that, but videos are really helpful for me. So remember when I was telling you when I was studying, I even sometimes kept getting confused with a process challenge device and a biological indicator. And his video was really helpful in kind of figuring some of this stuff out. So I highly recommend his channel. Go ahead and add him now, you know, open your phone, add him on YouTube and just check out some of his videos. His content is really good and he has lots of pictures, lots of visuals. And as you can see, his videos are not that long. So this one, which he talks about, you know, your negative pressure versus positive pressure in SPD, which is asked on the test. He has flashcards. Um, this is him breaking this down. And, in, and most of his videos are, you know, less than 15 minutes long. Most of them are about 10 minutes long or less, so it's really great. All right, so chapter 106, sterile processing. Sterile processing is the area most often responsible for reprocessing and sterilizing instrumentation and other reusable medical devices. If you have never been in a sterile processing department, I highly recommend that you reach out to a local hospital, um, say, hey, say, say, hey, I'm preparing for my CIC, I know that you guys are working with IPs or you're an IP yourself, so try if you can to go see one and spend some time in one um, because it's it's a really cool place in the hospital. Um, the process involves handling, collecting, transporting, sorting, disassembling, cleaning, disinfecting, inspecting, packaging, sterilizing, storing, <laughs> and distributing reprocessed items. They're really um, the heartbeat of the hospital. So they keep all of our operating rooms running, all of our procedural areas running. Um, I mean, they're, they are so, so, so vital to, to our facilities. All right, so what's the goal of sterile reprocessing? The goal is to provide safe, functional, and sterile instruments and medical devices to reduce the transmission of pathogenic organisms from patient to patient and to reduce the risk for a surgical site infection. So we have our decontaminant disinfection, that's one of our areas, our instrument assembly, our sterilization, and then our storage and distribution. So the history of SPD. In 1924, Misericordia Hospital, now Mercy Catholic Medical Center in Philadelphia, became the first hospital to establish a physically separate and designated area or department for reprocessing instruments and medical devices away from the operating rooms. So they were really, you know, kind of leading in, the, in this idea of a, a centralized sterile processing department. Um, and that's, this is one of the, the topics that they cover in the text where they mentioned um, one of the things that facilities are really trying to move away from is decentralized um, processing departments. So we want to try to have everything as centralized as possible because that's where we're going to have the most highly skilled team that will be able to ensure results consistently for our um, for our instruments. So location situation. Where is the cleaning, decontamination, disinfection, and reprocessing occurring in your healthcare facility? That's a really important question. Um, think about, do I have an offsite surgery center that I'm responsible for? 
how are those instruments getting to my facility? Are they going to my SPD? Do we, ha do we have a contract with someone else? Um, you need to start thinking about what other places um, are having contact with uh, you know, some of our, our instruments that need to get sent back to SPD. Your labor and delivery units, right? Okay, that's one of them. Emergency department is another. So we have to think about that. Where is the cleaning, decontamination, disinfection, and reprocessing occurring in your healthcare facility? Does it occur outside the, SP, the sterile processing area? Does it occur in the surgical areas or patient care areas? The infection preventionist needs to be aware of such practices to make certain that all items are reprocessed according to the same standards in all locations within the healthcare system. Uh, this is why <laughs> I love this video. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen this video of this reporter. Um, so I, I always like to include it because really, where, where are they at though? Like, where are all of our instruments, um, you know, being uh, reprocessed? We need to know all of that. So this powerful picture is from um, Ms. Linda Green. She's very well known in the world of um, IPs. I mean, she's an icon. And I was part of one of her infection prevention boot camps down here in Florida. And this is one of the pictures that she showed us. She said, we were doing high level disinfection of vaginal probes in this room, in this room. <laughs> so that's why this question of, do you know where high level disinfection, where, you know, where all of this stuff is happening in your hospitals. There's a lot of people who think, no, this can't be happening or, you know, but you'd be surprised the things that you'll find and the things that you'll see. I've been on many ICARs and um, there are some, there, I've seen some things. All right, I've seen some things. Now, do I have pictures of some of the things I've seen? No, but I have seen some things. All right, so these are the eight focus areas of SPD. We have our point of use and transport, physical environment of the sterile processing area, decontamination, preparation and packaging, sterilization, quality control, record keeping and storage. So these are all of the different areas um, that you're gonna wanna make sure that you're focusing on when you're studying. Point of use. This is a big deal. Um, so this is actually interesting because this is something that m my colleague Charles, uh, you know, we work together, that he's been working on very hard with um, our SPD team, our OR team, and also, sorry, and also our labor and delivery teams. So point of use cleaning. Goal, at the earliest stage possible, following a procedure, prevent organic matter from drying on instruments in microorganisms from growing on devices. So that's your point of use. At the earliest stage possible, following a procedure, you wanna prevent any sorts of biofilm from forming any bacteria, organic matter from really sticking on those instruments. So keep those in, keep that instrumentation moist so that bio burden is not dried onto the device. Clean those devices before biofilm can form and then contain contaminated devices to prevent accidental exposure to staff and patients. So knowledge check. Knowledge check. Is it recommended for instrument with lumens to be flushed with saline? Is this true or false? <laughs> no, don't. Don't do it. Yes. You should not be doing this. Don't. We don't want to be flushing these things with saline. Saline is corrosive. Saline is corrosive to our instruments. All right. So we want to make sure that we're using, you know, our sterile water to clean these instruments, um, that, that we're using, you know, our sterile water for, for this. So please do not use saline, it is corrosive to instruments. So this is an article from Infection Control Today, which this is a great newsletter. Um, they have good information, good articles. Um, and this was, this was an article on decontamination of surgical instrument begins in the OR. You have some specialties that are kind of a little bit more well known for turning in um, instruments that don't look so good 
not trying to call people out ortho. Um, but we know that we have uh, certain certain teams, certain groups where we can where we can sometimes see our instruments coming back just a little bit more soiled than others. And so what this document is really pointing to this this article is they're basically saying, listen, it's not all up to SPD. We need to be able to work together. I, I need you to make sure that you're doing your point of use cleaning so that we're able to, you know, actually have a good turnaround time on these instruments and so that we're able to help you. Um, because it does no good if you're if you're not, you know, doing your part for the team. So point of use cleaning is extremely important. Important. The importance of teamwork. Reprocessing medical devices requires a collaborative association between sterile processing staff and the clinical staff who use the devices, especially in operating rooms. This team must work together to provide safe, efficient, cost-efficient, and high-quality reprocessing. So once again, we're talking about teamwork. And I think, um, you know, this is this is a really important part of of helping others understand why this is so why teamwork is so important um people get so caught up on their you know on this is my role that is their role this is what i do this is what they do and we forget that we need to be everyone needs to be working together to ensure that we provide a safe environment for our healthcare staff and our patients um we 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 can't expect for SPD to do a, a great job and to get you those instruments back in time. If you're dropping instruments off, that look awful. That's just not, it, that's not an acceptable practice, right? Okay. Transportation. So we know that we should be transporting our instruments in rigid containers, um, you know, back back to our sterile processing areas. But you know, these are some pictures of ways that people might leave trays in, in SPD. You know, drop things off. And I mean, it's just, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, just picture you being the person who's you know receiving some of this stuff in the in the <laughs> in the zero processing department charles said shut him down <laughs> yeah so i mean you you have to you have to talk to your teams about and like i said it's not just it's not just about patient safety but also our healthcare staff members safety so like down here on this bottom left corner, you have all of these instruments that are piled a mile high in this um, in this bucket. And what if there's a sharp instrument, you know, in there that you are not really able to see, or you go and you reach down and something, you know, pokes you? Like you should not be turning things in like that into your sterile processing departments. It's just it's just not acceptable. It is not best practice. All right, so physical environment of the sterile processing area. Our goal is to prevent environmental conditions that encourage microbial growth and cross-contamination. We wanna ensure that the airflow, the airflow moves from areas of low contamination to areas of higher potential contamination. And we wanna ensure the proper air exchanges frequency to remove possible airborne contaminants. And we wanna control humidity and temperature levels. And so when you're reading your text there, they go over the, these different type of physical environments and parameters. And I have a chart a little bit later on down in the presentation where we'll discuss this. But for your test purposes, you need to remember that your decontam, um, your clean assembly, um, your storage, these things are gonna require certain temperature and humidity parameters that you need to know and that you need to keep in mind um, for your test, absolutely. Okay, so we want to prevent the formation of substances that protect microorganisms from further processing steps like biofilm. We want to ensure that the environment provides appropriate lighting for thorough evaluation of instrument for debris. That is so important. Yes, lighting is very important. We want to ensure staff safety and reduce microbial transport by personnel and ensure that hand hygiene products are available and that they are used. So it's not enough for the it's not enough for those products to be available. They also need to be used. All right, this is it's my girl. You already know Oprah. Okay, here she comes and she is telling you if it's not clean, it's not sterile. All right. So let's say it one more time. If it's not clean, it's not sterile. Cleaning. 
is the most important step in the sterilization process, point period blank, end of discussion, all right? If an item is not clean, it is not sterile, I want you to imprint this slide in your brain and to remember this, right? We have to get rid of all of that bio burden in order for an item to be truly sterile. Bio burden interferes with a chemical's activity, um, you know, to, to, to really truly kill all of that stuff. It also impedes our sterilization process. It needs to be, pro it needs to be properly cleaned or it's not sterile. Like, great, we could literally take a tray straight out from the OR, put it through a sterilizer and say, okay, well, we put it through the sterilizer, so it's sterile. No, no ma'am, it is not, right? If it's not clean, it's not sterile. I said it once, I'll say it again. So this is one of my favorite depictions of a sterile processing department. I couldn't find the usual picture that I use, but so this kind of red area over here that you see to the left, this would be considered your decontamination area, right? Right over here. In this right, in this bottom left corner, we have our washer disinfectors, which is moving us into the green zone. And that green zone is our clean assembly area. So you can see we have our little desks with our chairs. Um, you have fantastic lighting in there because you need to be look at all the, you need to be able to look at all the nooks and crannies of everything. Make sure that all of your instruments look great, fantastic, fabulous, ready for prime time. And then from from this area, right, you see these big refrigerator-looking things. Those are our sterilizers. We're rolling the instruments through there and then they're passing on to the sterile area where then they will get scooped away to be stored. And keep in mind, sterile processing departments are set up differently, so um, yours may not look exactly like this, but the general concept should be very similar. So ours doesn't look exactly like this, but the flow, the workflow is exactly the same as this picture. All right, so decontamination. Our goal is to protect workers from contamination with possible infectious materials. We want to ensure that air pressure in the work area is negative. Negative. Decontamination, you need, you need negative pressure. All right? With 10 air exchanges per hour and that all air is exhausted to the outside atmosphere. We want to ensure that gloves, masks, eyewear, and gowns appropriately protect staff from contact with contaminated fluids. Let me tell you something, it gets hot. <laughs> it gets hot when you're in decontam. I know the temperature is a bit lower, um, but it definitely, it gets, it gets hot, okay? So just be a little prepared for that. It can be a bit of a workout. Um, we wanna ensure that PPE prevents contaminated materials from entering the eyes or mouth. That is very important. Um, yes, 100%. Okay, so this is our use of personal protective equipment. We wanna make sure that we're using PPE during you know, our high-risk cleaning and disinfecting processes to reduce the risk for blood and body fluid exposure for processing personnel, and then written policies and procedures that promote consistent practice among healthcare personnel. Now, ideally, right, ideally, if your OR staff are doing what they're supposed to be doing, by the time an instrument comes back, to sterile processing, it should not be grossly contaminated. That should not be happening. What I can tell you the reality is, is that there is definitely um, some inconsistencies with that. And there were times when we got instruments, you know, when I was in the back doing decontam, that instruments that were grossly contaminated. And so that's why PPE is so, 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 so important. And you know, the gloves that you use for when you're doing decontam, they're, um, they're these water resistant gloves. They're, they're a bit thicker, um, significantly thicker than what we would use in, you know, in our patients' rooms. And they, they roll up a bit higher up. So they go further up so that you're really able to cover because you have to think about, you have to um, dip your hands into the, um, into the sinks because you have to make sure that you're brushing um, all of that equipment below the surface of the water. Why do we do that? Why do we brush our equipment below the surface of the water? Good job, Krista. Minimize aerosols. Yes, we want to minimize those aerosols. We want to avoid any potential exposures. Um, 
and reduce splashing, absolutely. Um, so when you're actually working in decontam, we have this high pressured water. Um, <laughs> I'll never forget. It was my first day. I was so excited. I was learning. Uh, you know, I was getting in there because I'm a very like hands-on person. I want to learn right away. And I stepped on the on the little because it's it's a foot pedal. So I stepped on the pedal for the for the high pressured water, and it just I don't know. I was clearly not paying attention, and it just splashed like it splashed because it was not below the surface of the water. <sighs> good times. Let me tell you, experience. Experience will will help you remember all of this stuff. So reduce, so decontamination continued, we want to reduce the bio burden and microbes to a level safe for use or further reprocessing. Ensure that the instrument manufacturer's written cleaning instructions for use are followed. Ensure that the mechanical cleaning of equipment, including use of cleaning solutions, follow the manufacturer's written IFUs. And we want to ensure that the cleaning chemicals are appropriate, diluted correctly, and not expired. And for a lot of you, when it comes to dilution, we have um, automatic diluters. So it's literally you 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 push a button, they've it's been pre-measured and it's going, you know, into that into that sink. They they already know um, what it needs to be at. Some of you may not be using a an automatic um, dispenser, but to my with with the experience that I have, I have seen that most facilities do use an automatic um, dispenser. We do have some places that may not use that automatic dispenser, but for the most part, our sterile processing departments should have that. All right, education and instructions for use your IFU. It is imperative for staff to be familiar with the principles of cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization, as well as the equipment manufacturer's written IFU for reprocessing equipment, such as mechanical cleaning equipment and sterilizers, and the IFU for chemical solutions, cleaning tools, disinfectants, packaging, cleaning, and sterilization monitors. The chemical solution manufacturer's recommendations provide guidance on the selection, use, mixing, and monitoring of the effectiveness of chemical agents and how to select the type of water. Tap deionized or distilled required for its product use. Our certification for staff. So, you know, I'm sure your SPD staff members, you have quite a few in there who are probably have their CRCST. Your SPD leaders more than likely have their triple crown or are working on getting their triple crown. So, I mean, this is a great thing for you to for you to explore. And even if you are not interested in getting your CRCST and becoming certified, what I will tell you is that their manual, so I studied with the eighth edition of, of their manual um, through ISHAM, and it has some really truly wonderful um, information. Their books, their book is full of pictures, examples, um, it does a really good job at what they need to at what they need to do and what they need to teach you. Okay, so we have about um, 15 minutes left. So I actually do want to be able to get to some questions. Um, we were going to be covering some other areas of decontamination, but that's okay. Um, you can just kind of read through those. So these are our environmental conditions. You can see here that they're explaining the work area to you. So you have your soiled and your decontamination area. They're telling you 10 exchanges per hour and it needs to be negative pressure and um, the easiest way that I always remembered um, these numbers was I always remembered okay I have to remember that our decontamination area is negative and it's going to have the lowest temperature <laughs> out of all of them um, because and the way I would always remember is it, I have to have low temperature because I know I'm going to get hot um, that's probably not the best way but I'm telling you it worked for me it might work for you so negative pressure our temperature is 60 to 65 and our humidity is 30 to 60. when in doubt when in doubt when it comes to humidity go with 30 to 60 all right when in doubt <laughs> like if you're like, oh, I'm not really sure about this test question, if 30 to 60 is an option, go with that one. Um, okay, assembly or prep and pack areas, positive pressure 68 to 73. Same for our sterilizer loading and unloading. Um, sterile storage is going to be positive. And temperature may be as high as 75, and we need less than 70% humidity. All right, so these are all videos, you know, of things that I watched, right? Because when I took my test, you have to remember, I didn't get the opportunity to really, you know, 
learn what an SPD department looks like. So guess what I did? I watched YouTube videos and I, you know, through the videos, I would pay attention and be like, oh, okay, this is this area. This is what they do. So these are all videos that I used when I was studying. So, you know, if you're an epidemiologist, you're working at, a, at the county health department and you don't have access to an SPD, don't let that be a deterrent. Don't let that, you know, say, oh, okay, well, you know, I, I'm just going to wait until I get that opportunity. No, just you have access to YouTube and YouTube is the key to learning basically anything that you want to learn. Um, you want to start up a business? YouTube. You want to learn about sterile processing? YouTube. You want to learn about being an IP? YouTube. Okay, so quiz time. All right, question one. A disadvantage to the use of the ultrasonic cleaner is A, the explosions caused by the bubbles can cause small particles of soil to be embedded in grooves and cracks of instruments. B, the implosions of the tiny bubbles may damage fragile instruments. C, the high frequency sound waves generated by the bubbles will damage the pacemakers of central sterile department employees. And D, the heat from the energy caused by the exploding bubbles can damage instruments. All right. Okay, so in addition to that, I have a lot of different answers here. I have every answer choice selected. What is the the explosion called by these little bubbles? What is that called? There's a name for that. What is it called? It starts with a C. San Josa, she said, I don't even need to think about it. I don't even need, I don't need a minute. I don't need 10 seconds. The name is Cavitation. I knew it, I know it now, and I knew it then. Good job. You are absolutely right. It's cavitation. Um, okay, so the correct answer is going to be the implosions of tiny bubbles may damage fragile instruments. That is one of the disadvantages of our ultrasonic cleaners. Ultrasonic energy is an effective is an effective technology routinely used to clean surgical and dental instruments prior to terminal sterilization. Ultrasonic cleaning uses cavitation bubbles induced by high frequency pressure waves to agitate a liquid. The agitation produces high forces of contaminants adhering to substrates like metals, plastics, glass, rubber, and ceramics. This action also penetrates blind holes, cracks, and recesses. Fragile instruments, however, may be damaged by its power. Materials such as quartz, silicon, and carbon steel may erode or become etched after prolonged exposure to ultrasonic cavitation. All right, question two. To facilitate drying and to reduce microbial contamination and proliferation in an endoscope, you should A, rinse with alcohol, hang vertically to dry, and store in a case to keep clean. B, Blow compressed air through the channel and rinse with 70% ethyl or isopropyl alcohol. C, rinse with tap water and blow compressed air through the channels. Or D, blow dry with compressed air, rinse with tap water, and hang vertically to dry. All right, let's see what kind of answers we're getting here. Guys, we're getting a lot of different answers. Mm. I typically feel more comfortable when we can narrow it down to two choices. Because then that lets me know we're at least on the right track. But I have, um, I have every answer choice kind of selected. Okay. So... The correct answer 
is going to be to blow compressed air through the channel and rinse with 70% ethyl or isopropyl alcohol. So what you need to focus on is the question is asking you to facilitate drying and to reduce microbial contamination and proliferation in an endoscope, you should, right? So, so the key here is we want to focus on that drying aspect. And when you think about that, right, when you, when you think about that, it helps to lead you to the right answer. Um, answer C, rinse with tap water and blow com geez, compressed air through the channels is incorrect. Um, blow dry with compressed air, rinse with tap water, and hang vertically to dry. That one just, it, you, you, if you think about it, if you walk yourself through it, why am I going to dry this, rinse this with tap water, and then hang it vertically to dry? Think about alcohol. What do we know about alcohol? And the... the in compare, oh, I'm so sorry. In comparison to water, right? Alcohol, evaporation, right? Thank you. Yes, it's gonna evaporate more quickly. It helps, you know, it's a drying agent. So absolutely. So we want to blow that compressed air through the channel and rinse with 70% ethyl or isopropyl alcohol. Okay, you're just being so difficult today. Um, rinse with alcohol, hang vertically to dry, and store it in a case. Okay, why are you being like this? I think it's just choosing to be difficult today. It's possessed. Why are you being like this? Okay. <laughs> Yes, we want to um, rinse with alcohol, hang vertically to dry, and store in a case to keep clean. Um, I mean, we definitely want to hang it uh, vertically, and we want to make sure that we store it that way. But once again, go back to the drying. So if you, ideally, you would have narrowed this down to either A or B, and blowing that compressed air would have helped to lead you to that, that first portion of the question to facilitate drying. Now, if the, if, if the question would have been to facilitate, you know, storage or more related to storage, that's when you would have, um, that's where I would have gravitated a bit more towards A, but. All right, so endoscope disinfection or sterilization with a liquid chemical sterilant involves five steps after leak testing. So we have to clean, we disinfect, we rinse, um, and then dry. Rinse the insertion tube and inner channels with alcohol and dry with forced air after disinfection and before storage. You can't see the slides? Oh, okay. Well, Okay, that should be better. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> All right, question three. Um, we're gonna be going over a little bit in time, but that's okay, we need to get through these questions. These questions are important. Question three, which of the following statements is true regarding the storage of sterilized items in the sterile processing department? You have to know this. All right, you have to know this. Um, sterilized, so you have multiple options. One, sterilized items should be stored on a shelf with a solid bottom. Two, sterilized items should be stored in high traffic areas for easy access. Three, sterilized items should be stored in a room with positive air pressure. And four, sterilized items should be stored eight to 10 inches from the floor. Okay, I love it. You guys definitely picked up on this one. So remember one of the tricks I've told you for these questions. Sometimes it's not about figuring out what's exactly right, but it's about figuring out what is a strong absolute no. And the, the strong absolute no for this one is going to be that sterilized items should be stored in high traffic areas for easy access. Absolutely not, absolutely not. Um, they should not be stored in high traffic areas. You want them in areas of limited traffic. You want these things stored eight to 10 inches from the floor. The airflow must be positive and open rack storage should have a solid, solid bottom to prevent soiling or contamination from the floor. 
this page right here, this one where it's talking about 18 inches from the ceiling if there's a sprinkler head or according to fire code, at least two inches from an outside wall away from sprinklers and air vents, this slide is very important. You need to know this. You need to know these physical storage prescriptions, um, sorry, restri restrictions, like point period blank, you have to know them. Whether you put them on an index card, um, whether you just write them out over and over and over again, these physical storage restrictions will be on the test in one way or another. You have to know this slide. Top to bottom, front to back, side to side, you gotta know it. All right, question four. Prior to opening a sterile package, the end user should inspect the package for one, tears, two, moisture, three, the date of manufacture, and four, the name of the person who packaged the kit. So with this one, we know that there, there's two answer choices. And so you need to immediately think out of these four, which are the two that are the most important. And the most important are one and two. We want to make sure that these packages do not have any tears or moisture, because if they do, we can no longer assume that these packages are sterile and we cannot use them. All right. So before use, sterile packages should always be inspected for signs of contamination, such as moist, moist, moisture, tears, or discoloration in addition to the expiration date. All right, question five. Which of the following recommendations related to disinfection and sterilization in healthcare facilities is a CDC category 1A recommendation? All right, so one, before use on each patient, sterilize critical medical and surgical devices and instruments that enter normally sterile tissue or the vascular system or through which a sterile body fluid flows. Two, meticul meticulously clean patient care items with water and detergent or with water and enzymatic cleaners before high level disinfection or sterilization procedures. Three, in hospitals, perform most cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization of patient care devices in a central processing department in order to more easily control quality. Or four, perform low-level disinfection for non-critical patient care surfaces like bed rails, over the bed table, and equipment um, that touch intact skin. So which of the following recommendations related to disinfection and sterilization in healthcare facilities is a CDC Category 1A recommendation? So the correct answer is gonna be one. So the CDC has established a system for cataloging recommendations based on the amount of data available to support the recommendation. Category 1A recommendations are strongly supported by epidemiologic, clinical data, or experimental data from well-designed studies. Sterilization of medical instruments that will come into contact with a sterile tissue or the vascular system is a Category 1A recommendation. All right, this is an easy one, so I'm gonna give you two seconds. Vaginal probes with probe covers require which type of disinfection? Low level disinfection, intermediate level disinfection, high level disinfection, or sterilization? All right, very good. High level disinfection. Um, all right, this is a good one. An ambulatory clinic will be transporting equipment to the local hospital for sterilization. The IP at the clinic has been asked to write a policy to ensure safe handling of the equipment by staff. The policy should include which of the following points on handling the instrument at point of use. Devices are to be clean, Cleaned before biofilm can form. Two, keep instrumentation moist to prevent bio burden from drying. Three, instruments with lumens should be flushed with saline. Four, contaminated devices are to be placed in a sealed container to prevent exposure to staff and patients.
So once again, sometimes it's not about figuring out which ones are right, but about which one is wrong. And we know that we should not be flushing instruments with lumens with saline. We really shouldn't be using saline at all when it comes to our instruments. It promotes corrosion. It, it is corrosive to our instruments. So once you figure out that three is not the one, it very quickly would lead you will lead you to the correct answer. So I don't want you getting caught up in these types of questions because there will be quite a bit of them. Um, there's a lot of questions that are basically that look just like this one where they're giving you all these options and you have to decide. So remember, sometimes it's not about which one is right, but about which one is wrong. And then we'll go ahead and do eight as the last one because we are a bit over time here. So eight, an inspection of the sterile processing department reveals several incorrect practices. Which of the following would be a correct practice? A, ensuring hinge instruments are cleaned with the hinge closed. B, flushing instruments with saline. C, daily use of a biological indicator in the sterilizer. And D, transporting contaminated instruments in a permeable container. Oh, yes, I apologize. I accidentally muted myself. So I just read this, you know, that our steam sterilizers should be routinely tested at least weekly, preferably daily, with a biological indicator process challenge device. All right, guys, well, we're about five minutes past our time. So we're going to go ahead and um, end for today. So next week, we're going to be covering um, the other. So remember that slide that I showed you guys with this part? So today we made it basically all the way to decontamination. So we can't, so we covered these first three little tiles. So for the other one, we're going to be diving, um, you know, diving down and onto our preparation and packaging, sterilization, quality control, record keeping, etc. Um, so you know, we will see you next Friday. Remember, this stuff is recorded. I still don't have access to my Department of Health email. So if you have emailed me, um, I am. I've been working since last week to try to get access to it again. Um, it's sometimes a little difficult, you know, since I volunteer remotely. But hopefully I will have access to it soon and you guys can actually um, <laughs> get an email from me. But thank you so much and I will see you all next Friday. And, and please, you know, take care of yourselves and your loved ones because we're not, it's not done with us yet, you know, so. Have a great weekend.